All right, let's watch some ACT math videos. Hey Shahir, what's up man? Yeah, dude, I've been looking for some good ACT math videos, but none of the ones on YouTube were actually good. Oh, no way, did you see Five Academy's videos? Usually they're pretty good. Nah, dude, I don't know about that. They weren't that helpful for math. Oh, that's kind of awkward, because you made those videos. Yeah, wait, what do you mean? You did too. Actually, I didn't, because I'm you from five years ago. We weren't making videos back then, so those videos are on you, man. What? How does that make any sense? What are you doing here? I don't know, I just thought I'd stop by. I didn't even have a beard five years ago. Where'd you get that from? Dude, like, don't worry about it. It's just some weird space-time continuum stuff. All right, so what do I do? Just make a better video. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, cool. Cool. Bet. See you, man. What's up? So today we're going to do something a bit different. Um, 25 ACT math strategies, the most I've ever done in one video. So uh, let's just start, I guess. Strategy number one, take 8 to 12 full practice exams because you need more practice tests to get more exposure to the exam, to get more used to the exam, to get better at your strategies, to get better at the timing, to get better at the skills, to get better at the question types, to do all seven things better. Free practice exams, link down below. Strategy number two is timing. The way you should time yourself is answer the first half of the questions in the first 20 minutes, the last half of the questions in the last 40 minutes. So you give yourself two times the amount of time at the end of the exam to answer the questions that are two times as difficult. Big brain moment. Now, if you can't do that strategy perfectly, just try your best to get as close as possible to that strategy. Strategy three is to cheat by back solving. Um, the way you cheat by back solving is you use the answer options to reverse solve the problem. Here's an example. So here we're trying to find the least common denominator of these three fractions. So we know that a least common denominator is really just a least common multiple. So we're looking for what is the least number that is divisible by all three of these numbers? Well, that problem statement, I can literally take any of these answer options and just check, okay, is 105 divisible by 15, five and seven? Is 75 divisible by those three numbers? Is 27 divisible by those three numbers? And whichever of these answer options is the smallest number that meets those conditions, that's your answer. So really, you're not really doing any math here, you're just checking which of these meets the condition that you've come up with. And that's really what you go through for all these back solving type problems. Strategy number four is to cheat by using your calculator. Here's an example. This is a perfect example of a problem where you want to use the calculator to really do the work for you and do the analysis. So it's asking what's the period of this function. Now no one on earth knows what the period of tan of 2x plus 4 looks like. But if you just graph the equation in the xy coordinate plane, the graph basically repeats itself every some distance. And if you find out that distance, you know what your answer is. So no analysis required, even this information is useless um, if you just use the calculator to do all the work. Strategy number five is to plug and chug. How do you plug and chug? You take a formula that you're given in the problem statement and you plug in each answer option to check which one works. Or if you're given formulas in each answer option, you just plug in imaginary numbers that you just make up, test cases into each one to test which one works. Here's another example. For a problem like this, you might think if you just look at the answer options and kind of analyze them in your head, you might be able to come to a conclusion on what the correct answer is. But what you really need to do is just plug in a number X that meets this condition into all of these, find what you end up getting when you plug that X in, and then see which one, which of them has the greatest value. That should take you a maximum of 10, 15 seconds. But if you try to sit through this and think through it, it might take you a minute, minute and a half because it's a lot of processing and you're dealing with square roots and squares and all that stuff. So just plug and chug. Strategy number six is to guess. Make sure that you guess if you don't know what you're doing because if you just sit there and stare at the problem, you're gonna waste the entire exam's time and you're not gonna get anything done and you'll get like a negative three on the math test. That's not a good thing. Strategy number seven is to skip problems. Again, kind of goes with the guessing thing, but if you don't know what you're doing, you gotta move on. Give yourself 30 minutes, sorry, 30 seconds to 60 seconds per problem. And if you can't figure out a plan on how to solve the problem in 30 to 60 seconds, you gotta skip it. I'm sorry, come back to it later if you have time. But there might be questions later on in the exam that might be easier, so you wanna devote time to those and make sure you actually get a chance to solve them. 
Strategy eight is to memorize formulas. There's a video that I'll link in the card. There's like 60, 70, 80 formulas you can memorize. Probably half of them are very important, so try them. Strategy number nine is to review mistakes so that you learn the skills that you actually don't know. I don't know if you're aware, but the ACT math exam tests you on like skills that are a uh, very large in number. There's a lot of skills. So if you want to learn those skills, you first need to identify which skills you're not good at. And the way you learn which skills you are not good at is by looking at the specific problems you get wrong and identifying what those skills are. And if you do this for eight to 12 practice exams, you'll actually start to notice patterns in the type of skills that you keep getting wrong or the type of questions you keep getting wrong. It'll be the same type of stuff again and again. Strategy number 10 is to keep a journal of hard problems. Um, it's a good idea to like, if you take a blank notebook and just write the focus. Strategy number 10 is to keep a journal of hard problems that you've come across. So for example, Strategy 10, keep a journal of hard problems. So every time you get a problem wrong or you find a problem to be very difficult, put it in a journal, write down some notes about it, and do this for all the problems you keep finding very difficult. You'll start to essentially, it'll help you notice those patterns about what you're really struggling in, all right? A blank notebook, just taking notes on which problems you got wrong is a great move. Strategy 11, 10 plus one, 11, is to label your diagrams. Here's an example of why it's important. So overall, I always recommend label and show work as much as possible, especially when you have visual problems, geometry problems, diagrams. Having a visualization will limit the amount of errors that you make. It'll make sure that you understand the problem visually and you put the pieces of information that you're given in the right place. Strategy 12 is to mem Strategy 12 is to memorize your right triangles. Here are the right triangles and why they're important. Now it's extremely important that you memorize these two triangles because they will pop up on a lot of problems, especially those relating to the unit circle. So if you know this, you basically know the entire unit circle by heart. Strategy 13 is to cram effectively. There is a right way to cram on the math exam and there is a wrong way to cram for the math exam. The wrong way to cram for the math exam is to do no studying until like two or three days before the test and you do like 12 hours of studying a day right before the test and that's how you have burnout and don't make it through the exam. But if you wanna do well, if you wanna cram effectively, I'd recommend that you study for the few months leading up to the exam and even the light night before, the week before, you do a light amount of practice per day. Maybe a bit less than what you were doing before, but keep a light amount of practice just so you can keep those strategies fresh in your head. You don't forget all those skills and you actually, you know, just keep practicing a little bit, especially those sections that you're really weak in. Get some last minute practice in them, all right? So that's how you cram effectively. Don't do too much work that week before or that day or a couple days before, all right? For the next strategy, you need to keep in mind that for any right triangle, all you need is a side and any angle, apart from the 90 degree angle, to solve the rest of the triangle. And again, this only applies for right triangles. So in this example, I only know 51 degrees and a hypotenuse of two, okay? So how can I find the last angle and the other two sides? You use the sine cosine tangent ratios, okay? If you remember, so ga toa, you can construct these ratios. This one solves for Y, this one solves for X. Once you have Y and X, you know this, and then you can solve for Z using the fact that all three angles here must add up to 180 degrees. How do you solve a system of linear equations? How do you construct and solve a system like this? What you need to remember is that in any example that you're given, you're gonna be given an initial uh, base value, which is gonna be your y-intercept, and you're gonna be given a rate, okay? And that's gonna be your slope m. So the equation, if we look at y equals mx plus b form, this equation for cost y is just gonna be three x plus one, okay? Um, you can do this now. Let's imagine in this example, there was another gas station that we're comparing this with. And let's say that had a, a lower gas cost, but a higher initial fee, okay? So, and let's say the question asks, how many gallons do you need in order for the costs to be equal? So the way you do that is use the substitution or the elimination methods. How do you use either one? So the substitution method is to take this Y value and just plug it in here, or in essence, plug two X plus two into Y here. So that would become two X plus two equals three X plus one. And you solve that for X, you'll get an X value. And you can plug that X value into either equation and solve for Y, okay? The elimination method is a little bit different. So what you would do in the elimination method is take one equation um, and take the other equation and you would subtract one from the other, okay? So I'm subtracting the bottom equation from the top. So for X, I'll, if I subtract this way, I'll get just one X. One minus two ends up becoming negative one and Y minus Y is zero. So you'll get X equals one and that is when after one gallon, you'll see that the 
costs y are the same. And you can plug, find the value of y by just plugging x equals 1 into either equation, you'll get the same y value. Scientific notation problems, what you can do is just treat it as two different problems. The first problem is just solving the decimal part, so doing 3.2 divided by 1.6, which is obviously equal to 2. And the second half of the problem is where you're going to get some exponent 10 to the n, uh, but that n value is just going to be the top exponent 6 minus the bottom exponent 3, okay? So your answer here is 2 times 10 to the 3. You treat it as two separate problems. So with problems like this that are very common about rational numbers and irrational numbers, what you're asked to do, regardless of whether you know what this means or not, you're, you're asked to find which of these is essentially unique, which of these numbers doesn't fit with the rest of them. Um, so the general strategy I want to you, you to use, regardless of if you know what this means or not, is just evaluate each of these numbers or each of these expressions to its most simple decimal form and then identify which ones are a misfit. So uh, that'll give you an idea at least of how you can narrow down the answer options if you don't know what this means. But if you want to know the definition, a rational number is a number that can be written as a fraction of whole numbers. So if you evaluate E, this gives you half. It's a fraction of whole numbers. If you look at the other answer options, they none of them can actually be expressed as a fraction, fraction of whole numbers in, in no way possible, right? So that's why E is the answer, but if, even if you forget what this means, you, you, you know how to approach these, you just look for the unique answer option. Now, how do you solve absolute value equations? There's three steps to getting it right every time. Let's look at this example here, okay? First, you need to isolate the absolute value brackets, which are this right here, okay? You isolate them by, you know, subtracting away whatever's here and then dividing everything by two, right? Uh, then you're gonna get two different equations. So let's first do the isolation part. So the isolation, we end up getting two absolute value of three X plus four equals 10, divide by two on both sides, absolute value three X plus four is equal to five, okay? Now I've done this part. I isolated the absolute value brackets, it's just by itself. Now, what I need to do is I need to get two equations. For the first one, I take away the brackets and solve. So my first equation, take away the brackets and solve, okay? Very easy, it's just simple algebra. The second equation, I replace the brackets with parentheses, okay, parentheses, and then I do what? Place a negative sign outside the parentheses. And then solve. Okay, so you'll get two different answers. X is going to be something here, and X is going to be something here. If you plug either one of these X values into the original absolute value inequality, or equation, sorry, um, you'll get the same answer. You'll, make, you'll see that the answer is actually true. Okay. So in a problem where you're asked to arrange fractions in increasing or decreasing order, there's a very simple method you can use that'll take maximum 20 to 30 seconds. Okay, so what you do is you take each of the fractions and you plug them into your calculator as uh, division statements. So instead of saying, think of it as six over five, you think of it as six divided by five and you write that decimal 1.2, which is the answer, uh, right next to that fraction. Once you have all your decimals written out the way I do right here, you order the decimal. And that's exactly what this is. So my answer is C, okay? The next strategy is all about manipulating an average. So it's very common that you'll see questions on the math test where you're gonna be given a list of numbers. You'll be told that two unknown numbers were added to the list and the average of the new list is 10. So what could have been those numbers that were added to the list? So you essentially wanna find what's the difference in the sum of numbers. And the way you're gonna do that and conceptualize this very abstract problem is to remember the basic average formula and then manipulate that formula. So uh, we're going to take the formula, which is average is just sum divided by the number of numbers. We're going to plug in the average of 10 is equal to the number of numbers on the denominator, plus, you know, all of those items, we'll call them x plus y as our two unknown numbers. If you solve this for x and y, you'll end up getting x plus y equals 28. So you know that b is the only possible answer because the sum is 28. But the key is we took this very simple formula and manipulated it, and that's something you're going to have to be able to do on the test. So keep in mind when you get weird average problems like this, it just boils down to taking this formula and moving some things around. Next strategy is about how to approach problems where you're graphing a systems of inequalities in the coordinate plane. So there's a few things you need to keep in mind. Let's start with the circle inequality. So with shading circle inequalities in the coordinate plane, there's two ways to do it. X, let's just write out the inequality really quick. So if it's a less than, what you're going to do is if the side of the equation with X's and Y's is less than the other side of the equation, you're going to be shading inside. Okay. Think of, think of this as, I mean, this right here is your radius squared, right? If your X's and Y's are less than your radius squared, that means you are constrained by the radius. You're inside of it. 
and the opposite is true if this is a greater than. So if you're greater than the radius squared, you're outside the circle. All right, in this case, clearly we're shading inside, so we have to make sure we choose a less than. Um, and then the other part is just about the y is, you know, when you have inequalities in the form y is greater than or less than, if it's greater than, if it's y is greater than, you're gonna be shading above the graph. If it's y is less than, you're shading below, okay? So in this case, we're clearly shading above this parabola, so we're gonna have a greater than. And from that, you can answer the question. Next strategy is about how to approach probability questions no matter how difficult they are. Most probability questions will generally fall into the category of just testing you on this very formula right here. Probability of any event is just gonna be the number of desired outcomes divided by the number of total outcomes. Okay, so in this case, we're asked how many red dots must be added to this bag so that the probability of randomly picking a red dot is one out of three. Currently, the probability of getting a red dot is four out of 28, which is one out of seven, and that's much less than one out of three. If you wanna increase that, what we have to do is um, we have to add red dots to the bag, right? So what we're gonna do is probability of the event is gonna change to four plus X additional red dots and 28 plus X additional red dots to the total. And we need this to equal one out of three. What I've done right here is I've taken my probability formula, which is this right here, and I just manipulated it to get an equation that I can solve for X. If you cross multiply divide, you solve for X, you get your answer. And I think the answer is 12 if I'm not mistaken, but double check that yourself. Try it. Hopefully it makes sense. But the idea is a lot of these problems just boil down to this very simple formula. If you know how to manipulate it, as we have discussed in the previous problems in this video, this will ensure that you can succeed on problems like this. Another question that comes up a lot is finding the probability of a repeating event. I'll call it RE. So the way you do this is actually very simple. You find the probability of each event individually and you raise it to the nth power where n is the number of repetition, okay? So in this case, we are doing a multiple choice test. There's three questions and we have a one out of four chance of getting each one right. So your answer is just gonna be one out of four to the third, because we're looking for what's the probability that you get all three correctly if you just guess. This ends up being one out of 64, okay? So it's a very simple problem. Just remember this formula right here. Next strategy is how to approach least common multiple and greatest common factor questions. So with least common multiple questions, it's very simple. All you're looking for is what's the smallest answer option that's divisible by all three of these numbers. With greatest common factor questions, it's the other way around, okay? So just in this case, this example right here with the LCM, you're just gonna do 128 divided by 35. You see that doesn't work. 252 divided by 35 that doesn't work. So these two are out. 1280 divided by 35, I think that works. And you go ahead and you check the rest of these. And if they all work, then this is your least common multiple. If that doesn't work, the next biggest number is. If that doesn't work, the next biggest number. That's kind of the way you go through these. And again, the opposite is true of greatest common factor. So try a LCM and greatest common factor question using the strategy and see where it gets you. The last strategy I wanna go over is about approaching proportions questions and using the cross multiply and divide strategy effectively. So here we're given a recipe where you have two and a half cups of milk and some other stuff and it makes 10 pancakes. So if the chef has five cups of milk, how many pancakes can he make? So the ratio you need to look at is uh, cups of milk to pancakes. In this case, we're told it's 2.5 to 10. So 2.5 to 10 has to always be true for cups of milk to pancakes. So if I have five cups of milk, I have some unknown number of pancakes. I can solve this proportion or equation for x by just cross multiplying. So 2.5x is equal to 50. You can divide both sides by 2.5, do the math, you get d. Okay, but the idea is you set this up, you find the ratio that's defining the problem, you set it equal to a new ratio with one unknown, and then you cross multiply.